We've got an update on Shohei Otani's former interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara's betting scandal, some big injury updates on Clayton Kershaw, Walker Buehler, Blake Trinan, and Bruce Dark Gratterall. More details about Will Smith's contract and who did the Cardinals want from the Dodgers for Nolan Arenado. All that more here on this jam-packed episode of Dodgers Dugout. It's time for Dodger How many times this team rips my heart out? I'll never stop loving the Los Angeles Dodgers. They blue, 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 and I'm out. Hey, what's going on, Dodgers Nation? Doug McCain here, credential member of Dodgers Media. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. Now, if you haven't yet, do me a huge favor and subscribe to the number one Dodgers YouTube channel, the number one show, Dodgers Dugout. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Hit that like button. Also, make sure you comment done down below so you're eligible for our next giveaway, which comes at 90,000 subscribers. Haven't announced what it is yet, but that announcement is coming soon. So definitely be on the lookout for that. So all you got to do is subscribe and comment done to be eligible to win and also want all your takes down below. What are your thoughts on the latest update on Shohei Otani? You concerned at all? Do you think it's going to end up being nothing at the end of the day? What are your thoughts on opening day? How the team look? What are your thoughts on these injury updates? And also, do the Dodgers need to add another starter at some point this season? Who would you like to see them go after? Let me know down below. And for all latest Dodgers news, head over to DodgersNation.com. So it's finally fully here, Dodgers Nation. Baseball season has arrived. For the next seven months, for the most part, you're going to have Dodger baseball every single day. And yesterday, what a great day at Dodger Stadium. The ravine was buzzing. You had Josh Groban singing the national anthem. You had Brian Cranston reading off the players' names and introductions. You had the blue carpet going through center field, and they were there to see... Shohei Otani. The 52,000 plus in attendance were absolutely buzzing. It was an electric atmosphere and Shohei Otani doesn't disappoint. In his first at bat, he sits back on a changeup. He cranks a double that could have been a stand-up triple and he runs through a Dino Evil stop sign. He doesn't see Mookie Betts at third and fortunately he's out at third and that would just goes to show. One, he was absolutely just psyched and hyped and ready to go for this one. But two, hey, is he used to seeing that many men on the base pass, right? I mean, he has not had this many opportunities in his career like he's going to see with the Dodgers. So he's going to have to get used to this, seeing guys in front of him on the bases. So, yeah, I thought it was really spectacular just to see him impact the game with his wheels, too. I mean, you saw how fast he was. Yes, he was out of third, but you're going to see this season. I think Shohei Otani is going to steal 30 to 40 bases this year I truly believe that and it wasn't anyone's fault other than himself you saw them in the dugout after and he's communicating with Mookie Betts and Mookie has actually told him hey I'm not that fast right and things like that at this part of his career but look you had no outs it was a scoreless game there in the first you had Freddie and Will Smith do up it's understandable by Dino Ebel why he kept him at third base but still I think it's more on the fact that Otani was just really juiced and ready to go. And then later in the game, in the fifth, he hits a single. It was 113 miles per hour off the bat. That was already a harder hit ball than any Dodger since 2021. So we're talking about someone that's hitting absolute rocket shots. And I see people saying, oh, where are the home runs? How come he hasn't left the yard? Well, one, two of those fly balls in the Soul Series that kind of died in right center field. They could have left the yard, but the ball wasn't as really flying as much there in Korea. And also, this is something that the power starts to pick up in mid-April. It's a known fact with Shohei Utani that in a couple of weeks, that's when the power picks up and he starts to hit moonshot. So wait for that sound. Wait for that shotgun sound. When the bat hits the ball for Shohei Utani. that's when you know it's going deep into the bleachers and you're going to start to see a a ton of home runs from Shohei. But another update about Shohei Otani has to do with, of course, the ongoing Ipe Mizuhara 
betting scandal. And Rob Manfred, he was on high heel with Chris Russo, and he had some comments about it. He told him, given the way the story unfolded, it's important in terms of assuring our fans about the integrity of the game that we verify the things that Mr. Otani has said, and it's really that simple. The IRS has confirmed Mizuhara is under investigation. Now, because of that, he said it's really difficult for the federal authorities to cooperate with us fully when they have their own ongoing investigation. So I think this is one where we'll have to proceed on our own. We never have the kind of authority that law enforcement people have, but we managed to get investigations done and find the facts, and I'm sure we will on this one. And when we was asked about the timeline of the investigation, how long it's going to be, Manfred said, I hope short, but I just don't know. So very interesting thing for a commissioner to say that he hope it's short. He really should probably say, I just hope that, hey, we want to get all the facts and have a thorough investigation. But this tells me that, hey, he's thinking dustpan and broom. He wants to sweep this under something and just make sure that Shohei Otani and Major League Baseball, their interests are fully protected and that everything that Shohei Otani said at his press conference a few days ago at Dodger Stadium when he read his statement and he essentially said, look, Ipe Mizuhara was a liar. He was lying to me. He was stealing from me. I had no knowledge of this. I had zero involvement of this. And they just need all of that to turn out to be true. And the Dodgers and Otani are going to be just fine. Now, I want to point out, too, that if you look at MLB's rules, as far as their punishments go, the punishments are very clear. If you bet on any sports other than Major League Baseball, he would get a fine. If you bet on Major League Baseball that wasn't his team, he'd be suspended for a year. If you bet on baseball that was his team, he'd be banned for life. But right now, there's no link to Shohei Otani and him betting. This is Ipe Mizuhara's issue, and it was revealed that he met with this illegal bookie at a poker game in San Diego, and the poker game is where he learned that I could get a $4.5 million betting credit, and that's when he was really getting himself in deep. So I hear that out there. How does anyone out there that's making $85,000 a year, how's anyone that's $85,000 in their salary able to make bets and lose money up to $4.5 million? Well, one, you have to believe that maybe he was manipulating the bookie, saying he'd probably get the money from Shohei Otani in some capacity. And that probably is kind of where it stems from. Is Look, any guy that's lying this much to multiple different people probably has a scheme and he's able to manipulate but as of right now that's really where it stands the investigation is ongoing and it's going to be very interesting because look what's going to happen to Mizuhara that's to me is the number one thing we need to see this guy face punishment if I go down the street and I walk into a store and I steal a hundred dollars worth of merchandise I'm getting handcuffed and I'm going to jail Okay, so what's going to be the punishment for someone that's stealing four and a half million dollars, right? I mean, someone that has clearly done illegal wire transfers. So it's going to be very interesting. I know that a lot of people have issues with the fact that he recanted his story, the original story he told to Tisha Thompson of ESPN, where he made it abundantly clear that Shohei Otani was giving him the money to get out of this debt and that he was really unhappy about it. And then Otani's people, they got wind of it and they went 180 and they said, look, I had no involvement in this. I don't had no prior knowledge of this. So I think we still need some more information. We need some more facts about this. But as of right now, Major League Baseball, that comment really sticks out to me by Rob Manfred, hoping that it's short. Okay. So look, We'll give you more information as we get it, but that's where it stands right now. I don't think that it's impacting his play at all whatsoever. Dave Roberts mentioned it yesterday, and you can just feel it. I mean, he's definitely out there calm, cool, and collected. He's happy. I feel like he's less guarded because you don't see Ipe around him as much. Just from my own personal eyes, he's interacting with his teammates more. I think his teammates are more comfortable going up to him and interacting with him more. That's the impression I got from him and even yesterday in the clubhouse with Shohei Otani they had the big backdrop with all the sponsors on him 
he was happy to answer questions. And even when they switched to Japanese media, you still ha- heard him answer a couple more questions. And I felt like he was embracing the media more. And you heard about his time in Anaheim that he didn't like press rooms. He doesn't like it like that. He likes answering questions in the clubhouse near his locker so he can kind of keep it as short as possible. But he was engaging. And I thought it was cool. His wife was there yesterday in their box. Decoy was there. And uh, by the way, if you look in the box, notice this. You see his Ham Fighters jersey. You see his Dodgers jersey. You also see his Japan WBC jersey. You got all of his jerseys except the Anaheim Angels jersey and, of course, the All-Star jerseys. But really cool to have that box there for decoy. I mean, he's basically, in my opinion, the unofficial Dodgers mascot. He is the Dodger dog right now, Mr. Decoy. So that was cool to see him there. But, yeah, I think that this... Might take a little time just because an investigation is ongoing. But, man, I'd be shocked if by the way that Otani said the things he said yesterday, he was aggressive, he was confident, he was bold in his declarations, and he was firm in the words he used. Liar. I had no knowledge, no involvement. I didn't bet on baseball, all these things. I don't think that he would say those things knowing that the IRS and that Department of Homeland Security and they contacted law enforcement. I don't think that he would have said those things with that kind of gusto and confidence if they were going to be able to prove it was untrue because they're going to get to the bottom of this. I will tell you that they are going to get to the bottom of this and the truth is going to be revealed. And I think that the way he's carrying himself, the way he's performing, I wouldn't expect anything less. But right now, we'll just wait for more information as it surfaces. Now, Will Smith, a little update on his contract after... We did the quick rapid reaction video a couple days ago. We learned some more details about the contract itself. Of course, it's a 10-year, $140 million contract. And the only question was, how much money is there in deferrals? We know that the Los Angeles deferrals, and as we expected, there was a lot. $50 million in deferred money. And the contract, it starts this year in 2024, and... It replaces the $8.55 million on the one-year deal that he struck with the Dodgers to avoid arbitration in the offseason. And it also includes a signing bonus, $30 million signing bonus, where he gets $15 million on November 15th of this year and $15 million on January 15th of 2025. This is per Mark Feinstein of MLB.com. And he's also deferring $5 million annually. So... You got the deferrals in there. There's also some specific language that indicates that if he is traded, the remaining salary will be paid in season and it will take away all those deferrals for the remainder of that deal. So that's where we stand. If you look at the, its impact on the CBT, it's a 12.24182 million dollars against the CBT. So less than $13 million hit on the CBT, around $12.2 million. And if you look at the Dodgers right now, you're sitting at $321 million at the moment for overall team salary. And as you know, they're past the Cohen tax level, which is that $297 million. And anything above $297 million is taxed at a 110% rate. So It's a great deal for the Dodgers. I see people saying that he's underpaid. He could have gotten more. Maybe he could have gotten a little more, but he's essentially getting $6, $7 million of salary kind of stretched on 10 years. And he's doing that because he loves being a Dodger. He's doing that because he wants to win. And I can tell you from talking to Will Smith that this is someone who loves the day-to-day process of just being an elite major league player, an elite major league catcher with the focus on winning the World Series. This guy is as competitive as it gets. He has such a great work ethic. You see him working with pitchers, working on his hitting and all the things that he does in the cage. He hits the ball hard, and that's something that that he does as good as anyone out there. And I think that this is a perfect situation for him because I think he almost feels more comfortable being on the Dodgers as the fourth or fifth star than, let's say, he hits free agency, signs that bigger deal. I mean, who knows how the market's going to be, right? The market has not been solid. 
And who knows what it's going to look like in a couple years from now. He has the security with the Dodgers, okay? Knowing that you have that money. And you look at his personality type. If he had hit free agency and he signs with the team for 140, 150, 160 million, I mean, I don't anticipate getting 200 million. I saw people throwing that number out there. That was pretty unlikely for being completely honest. But if he signs with a team like that, that means they're signing him to be basically one of the big time stars of their team as far as the marketing goes, as far as having him go out and be the guy that's always at the events and the guy that they're showcasing, right? Will Smith doesn't love that side of baseball. Will Smith's favorite part about baseball is baseball itself. And beyond the Dodgers, he still gets the love from the fans. You still hear the cheers, and everyone respects and knows how good of a player he is. He can make multiple all-star teams on the Dodgers, but you also have Otani. You also have Betts and Freeman, all these other stars that kind of can take some of that limelight. So he can focus on what he loves to do most, and that's be the catcher for this team. So that's why I think it's such a perfect situation for him and frankly why he was able to really come to an agreement on a deal that both sides felt really, really good about. And uh, just think about this off season. I mean, to tie a bow on this off season, which we're already in the season when this was done, essentially, I mean, to have this as a bow on it just really takes it to a whole nother level because you guys know, if you've been watching this show, I've been talking about a Will Smith extension since pretty much forever and I said that this is the one guy that you really kind of want to break your rules on as far as these homegrown guys you're going to let walk. And it's great to see that Andrew Friedman and the rest of this organization kind of felt like, you know what? Yeah, we have catchers coming up in the pipeline. Guess what? They're prospects. At the end of the day, they're unproven. We have an all-star catcher now that's in the prime of his career that we can align with Betts and Otani and Freeman. And we got our top four intact go out there and win some World Series together, and then let's use some of these prospects as trade chips. So thought that was such a great move, and to see the details of it, the deferred money, it only helps this team acquire more talent. Now, some injury updates. Yesterday, we got some pretty detailed updates on some currently injured Dodgers, starting with Bruce Dark, Gratterall, and Blake Trinan. Now, of course, they started the season on the IL, and They just are not going to be expected to be able to return when those 15 days are up. Dave said they're both playing catch. Two days ago, they were at Dodger Stadium playing catch while we were in Anaheim. They both had a good day of throwing off flat ground. They're not throwing pens right now, so we're still a ways away for both guys. Now, Bruce Dar, he's been out with right shoulder inflammation And he just wasn't ready to go during spring training. He only appeared in one Cactus League game. And then Blake Trinan, he got hit by that line drive that thankfully wasn't a cracked rib or a broken rib, but he does have a bruised lung. So the earliest that both can return would be April 3rd, but clearly they will not be back by April 3rd. So that's definitely something to monitor. I think the Blake Trinan one is a little different in the sense that we saw him get a good amount of time, some serious reps during spring training. And in those reps, he looked really good. He found the slider again. The velocity was there. As long as he can get back healthy, I think he's going to have the ability to contribute for this team. Bruce Dark Gratter, on the other hand, anytime you hear shoulder inflammation, he's dealt with some shoulder stuff in the past. The way he throws, the high velocity is definitely a little bit of a concern considering the high workload he had last season when he had his best year as a pro. It really doesn't get talked about enough how great Bruce Dark Gratterall was last season. He was absolutely elite. He had a 1.2 ERA. That was the fourth lowest ERA in Dodgers team history with a minimum of 40 innings. The lowest all time, Evan Phillips, 2022, 63 innings of work, 1.14 ERA. You also have Han Shi Kuo in there. You have Eric Gagne in there. But he was outstanding. He had a 3.09 expected ERA. That was the best on the Dodgers. And that includes guys like Evan Phillips and Ryan Brazier. He's also riding a scoreless streak. He did not allow a run in his final 25 innings of work. I mean, he was outstanding. That was the longest scoreless streak by a Dodgers reliever since they moved to L.A. in 1958. So, yeah, they need him back in a big way. And him along with Evan Phillips and Ryan 
Brandon Brazier. They were the three best relievers on this team, and they're going to be a big part of this season. So I'm just hoping that it's nothing too bad or anything like that, and he needs to get back and start to have a big impact on this team because we know the bazooka is an essential part of this bullpen success. Now, on the positive side, Walker Bueller continues to make progress, and Dave Roberts said that he could be back sooner than they expected. Doc said, we still have to decide whether he's going to go to AAA or if he's going to go to Arizona to continue to build up, but Walker is coming. I think he's coming sooner than we anticipated, which is a good thing for everyone. And Walker Bueller pitched four innings a couple days ago. It was four simulated innings at Dodger Stadium. I was in attendance for that, and Bueller had some hard contact against him a couple times. Hope DePaula had some nice contact off him, but for the most part, the ball was coming out really nice. He looked like it was effortless. He looked physically like he was there. I mean, he's gained more weight. He looks like he's got more muscle. And Walker Buehler, he's ready to go. He's getting close. He's getting close. And I have all the confidence in the world that Walker Buehler is going to have himself a successful season. I mean, this guy is champing at the bit to get back out there on the mound and show that he's still Walker Bleep and Buehler, that Butane still has it. And I could be more excited about that. And then also, Clayton Kershaw. Jack Harris of the LA Times, he talked to Kirsch and he found out that Kirsch was throwing from 120 feet. Dave Roberts said that he was extremely impressed with Kirsch's progress and that he's also ahead of schedule. And then most importantly, he's pain free. Now, Kirsch was there yesterday. He walked down the red carpet. He took a really cool picture with Sandy Koufax. And I remember seeing him after the game. He was walking out of the clubhouse. It was pretty funny. I was walking into the clubhouse and there were just hundreds of media members, there's tons of cameras. And Kirsch was like, wow, this is crazy. This is impressive, guys. And Kirsch says, hey, I hope they tell you something cool in there. So he's got his personality. He's got his sense of humor about him. And I think he is definitely on the right track to come back and definitely give this team a boost at some point in the summertime. I think he's in a really good spot right now. I'm just very encouraged by the fact that he's already thrown on flat ground and he's definitely pain free. So you love to see that. Now, another thing that I found really interesting yesterday was during the broadcast on the radio, Steven Nelson, he mentioned that Nolan Aaron Nado and the Dodgers. Of course, there's that connection there. And that last year at the deadline, when there was some rumors the Dodgers were interested in trading for Nolan Arenado, that the Cardinals wanted Bobby Miller in return. Now, remember that there was someone that kind of told you that uh, last summer that the Cardinals wanted Bobby Miller. All right, that's me, right? We talked about that. And really, what it came down to is did the Dodgers really want to trade their future ace? Bobby Miller, who they believe has the ability to be a frontline starter for many years under team control on a favorable year. He's pre-arbitration at this point. And I think that I'm not so sure the Cardinals would have absolutely pulled the trigger on it, but I just don't think that they were even close as far as exchanging names. And I don't think that it was ever something that was going to materialize at the deadline. But Nolan Arenado, great player. How much prime does he have left? That's a big question. I mean, he's still under an extremely favorable contract, right? I mean, talking about someone that's making north of $100 million for the rest of his time in St. Louis, when you compare that to what Devers got and Machado's got and all these other guys, I mean, you could say it's a pretty damn team-friendly contract as long as he performs like an all-star. But I think the Dodgers, I think, I would not be surprised if they need to add another starting pitcher at some point. It feels like... That's something they always have to add during the year for whatever reason. If guys don't work out, if guys get injured, it always seems like they're going to be in the market for one. And yesterday, Shane Bieber was a beast. Shane Bieber was outstanding for the Guardians in their opening day matchup. He had 10 strikeouts. He was lights out again, and he's under one more year of team control with the Guardians. If the Guardians aren't contending, I think Shane Bieber could be one of those top pitchers that are available, and the Dodgers have shown interest in Shane Bieber in the past. They were linked to him this offseason. I don't think he's a number one, number two right now, but Shane Bieber a UCSB Gaucho. By the way, the Gaucho's mascot is an Argentine cowboy. To bring him home, I think that'd be pretty interesting. That feels like a Dodgers trade deadline potential target if he's on the block in Shane Bieber. Yesterday, Luzardo for the Marlins, he gave up a home run. He wasn't at his best. 
but he's also under three more years of team control. That's what the Dodgers don't want to do, right? And I think for a rental, they'd be more likely to take a flyer on someone like a Shane Bieber who's going to basically give them half a season and won't cost as much. Also, Corbin Burns, he was lights out yesterday. And I think when it comes to the Dodgers, it's going to be really interesting to see how well Yamamoto performs because they could have clearly had Cease and Glass now or any of these guys, a combination of them. They had the prospect capital to get a deal done, but instead they went the, okay, let's trade for one route and then let's sign one route. Yes, of course, the day after the Dodgers season, I said they should trade for Glass now and sign Yamamoto. That's what happened. I still think at the end of the day, if you can acquire talent, especially starting pitching talent at the age of 25 in free agency, you do it. And they did. It's just a matter of giving him some time to adjust. I'm really optimistic about Yoshinobu Yamamoto. He was loose in the clubhouse yesterday, so he doesn't look like he's stressed at all. So I think that he's ready to go as well. But let me know down below in the comments section, what are your thoughts on Shohei Otani, his time with the Dodgers so far, the big three, the MV3. What are your thoughts on the investigation? Do you think it's going to be a short investigation? I think it's going to be a thorough investigation. Could take month to two months, something like that. We'll see what happens, what transpires with all of this, but hopefully it's not a distraction. I will say just my observations yesterday, being in the clubhouse, there was a lot of media members in there, and you saw some of the players kind of rolling their eyes a little bit and just thinking to themselves like, man, this is very intense. And it's going to be interesting to see how they handle it. Now, it was opening day, mind you, you're not going to see that many media members there every single day, but I just will tell you that the vibe inside that clubhouse from the players like, holy crap, like we expected something to be bigger because of Otani, but it did feel like, holy smokes, this feels like it's a lot, but uh, it's going to be fine because you get Shohei Otani and it comes with the territory. When you get the biggest superstar in the sport by a, a mile, well, hey, you're going to see attention like this. But that's going to do it for this episode of Dodgers Dugout. We'll be back with you guys later because we've got to debut this year's version of the post-game show. So be on the lookout for that. My name is Doug McCain. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to the number one Dodgers YouTube channel, the number one Dodgers show. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Hit that like button. Met some of you guys yesterday at Raising Canes. Thought that was really cool. Shout out to all you guys. Met some of you guys at the stadium yesterday. I have the permanent credential this year. So I'm going to be giving you guys a behind-the-scenes look. We're going to be doing exclusive streams from Dodger Stadium. Going to give you guys as much access as I possibly can. So we're on this journey together, guys. And if you see me at the stadium, definitely come up and Holler at me. Love talking ball with you guys, as always. But that's going to do it. Remember, nothing brings us together quite like Dodger baseball. And until next time, think blue, bleed blue, and I'm out.